The opinions expressed are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official positions of the sponsors, advertisers, or presenters. Advertising does not imply endorsement by the sponsors and presenters. Hey guys, and welcome back to the Lighting Controls Podcast. We have another fantastic guest for you today, but before we jump into the conversation, let me just take a minute to remind everyone that today's episode is presented by the LCA, the Lighting Controls Association. And it's financially supported by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, or NAILED. Check out our website, lightingcontrolspodcast.com, where we've got our, all of our episodes, a news feed, as well as um, additional resources like a merch store if you want to support the podcast, training events that are happening in the future, as well as um, information on the new council that Ron and I are starting up with NAILED to try to get more awareness of integration and startup. Um, additionally, if you're interested in supporting the podcast further than just the merch store, you should click on this link over here or just reach out to us to, be, to find out about becoming a sponsor. We'd really appreciate the support. But until then, let's get into the conversation. So today we have Kelly. Kelly, do you mind just giving us a quick breakdown on who you are and what you do? Yeah, I'm Kelly Gallagher. Uh, so I am a lighting control spec salesperson uh, for Chesapeake Lighting out at the DC metro area. A uh, little bit on my background, um, I was an IBEW Local 26 electrician in D.C. for about four years. Um, I loved it. You know, the, the work schedule was heavily 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. And, you know, that, <laughs> that put some constraints on regular life. Uh, and I, I started to work on jobs where I was there towards the end, like close to turnover, which is the time to see all of the beautiful light fixtures being installed you know, installing the final components for controls and actually seeing it programmed and turned over. Um, and that kind of lit a match for me. And uh, so I followed lighting controls as far as I could in um, the electrical trade until I went ahead over to a manufacturer to do startups and programming. Um, absolutely loved it, was going to stick with it for a long time. And my best friend uh, actually works at the rep agency that I'm at now. And uh, so he was like, we need a controls person. And you're the only person that I know who knows lighting controls. And of all the people at the agency, like nobody likes lighting controls. So it's like, okay, it's a good <laughs> fit. You know, I, I love lighting controls. I know it from a perspective of installation and of programming, but I don't know this design side and, and the sales role mm -hmm. yet. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's a little bit on, um, my my career and uh where i'm at currently so well thank you so much for joining us um you know it's really great to hear from somebody who's actually been a part of the installation process and just for our listeners who aren't familiar with what i ibew is do you mind just explaining that a little bit yeah so it's the international brotherhood of electrical workers it's the electricians unit union at least the the big overarching one um internationally, but primarily here in the States and Canada. Um, and so it, it provides an excellent um, program for education and experience on site for uh, those going into the electrical trade. So I highly recommend it. Um, you know, if, if you have any sort of aspirations to learn more, um, you know, the IBEW is, is all about uh, education. They, they offer courses which are typically free or very low cost to their members, but Others can also join at, at different costs, depending upon what the course is. Um, so yeah, that's that's the IBEW, and, and they offered a, a an excellent apprenticeship program um, with all the uh, you know going between contractors, so that you're well rounded and you don't get stuck with the same group of guys doing the same type of thing over and over and over again. Nice. Um, so it's like, in, in my opinion, the best way to learn um, how to become a, a great electrician. Mm -hmm. Well. I mean, that level of knowledge and experience from that territory, we don't get a lot of exposure to that. So, you know, if you mm. don't mind, I'd like to focus a little bit on that because of the fact mm. that, you know, getting contractors onto the show can be quite challenging. And I know you're not currently a contractor anymore, and we'll definitely get into your, your work as a rep, but I just want to explore this, this installation side of things a little bit more because um, I'm curious what the perspective is on the electrical contractor side when it comes to lighting controls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's 
excellent. And I could probably get some uh, contractors <laughs> who are interested in being on this podcast. Please. Yeah, uh, no, we'd love to awesome. hear. No, that'd be more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, you know, mark your words. They're quite opinionated. <laughs> <laughs> that's great to, you know, we love opinions they get yeah they get pretty passionate about it so it's it's good yeah. um so the the perspective of your typical uh journeyman electrician of lighting controls is uh okay leave that to that guy he's our lighting guy you know so most um electricians at least in in you know the territory where i'm in are not uh total hybrids you know, you, you have someone who gets up uh, to the journeyman level and then they begin specializing. So you have your fire alarm journeyman electricians and you have your lighting control journeyman electricians and then the gear and everything else that, that comes with it. Uh, very few and far between will you find uh, a young journeyman electrician who, yeah, I, I do it all. Uh, you find that sure. a lot of them, are they specialize. Um, right. And a lot of the perspectives that I get from uh, electricians are particularly helpful when it comes to documentation, submittals. Um, you know, they're, they're very big on making sure that the submittal has like all of the information uh, needed for them to get through not only the installation, but the commissioning process of when the commissioning agent comes and they want to check everything, that there's no weird assumptions of, oh, this was supposed to do this. Now, having a, a clear sequence of operations is actually quite important to an electrical contractor because they have something to point to as like, here's the right. approved submittal that says this room is supposed to do this. Um, so they they kind of grow in appreciation of that. Which, which is really good to hear. You know, we get a lot of perspective from the specifiers of the designers and the reps when it comes to um, how to implement sequence of operations, control intent narratives and all of mm -hmm. that. But, you know, to actually hear that it, it's being received quite positively in the field is a really mm -hmm. good thing to hear uh, because that means we are moving in the right direction and we definitely want to create those bridges between the design side and the construction side of projects. And mm -hmm. so having these additional resources um, is what we think is helpful. And to hear that, yes, it is helpful is great. Um, and so yeah, clarity is key. What would you say to, you know, designers who are trying to figure this out? Like, what are the core focus points when it comes to documentation? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so the key thing that I would hit on is like defining the function of each space. Like it, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that a control intent narrative and a sequence of operations, like if you can kind of have something in a written form and a chart form and everything just very cohesively explained uh, is helpful. Um, a lot of projects that come across, you know, our, our inside team, like what they're seeing at their desk um, is very, very little and very, very loose information. It's, you know, here's reflected ceiling plans and it shows occupancy sensor and occupancy sensor and switch. And, um, you know, along with that, we may ask through channels to have, you know, a, a spec provided also, you know, a sequence of operations, any of that kind of information provided. And oftentimes the specification, like the written specs are very, very generic. Um, mm -hmm. and there is no, uh, sequence of operation. So it, it right. it's basically us to, de to determine how that space needs to be put together. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that just puts us in a role that we don't, need to be in, right. um, or I, yeah. we shouldn't be in where, you know, like we can, we can assist in the design pro process, but we should never spearhead it. Um, right. unless we're asked by the designer to spearhead it. Um, yes. so yeah, well, and, and, you know, again, that I think that's really great feedback for people to hear. Um, it mm -hmm. aligns exactly with the advice that we've heard from various other groups. Um, and it, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of coincides with this mindset of a clear control intent narrative wins out over a poor RCP any day. And so yeah. you don't necessarily have to show an occupancy sensor right there on the drawing so long as you clearly identify this space needs an occupancy sensor or occupancy motion detection and these are the requirements of that motion detection yeah i i honestly like that better you know and and i think that most people should like it better to not have the drawings all clouded up 
you know, but you give something as like an indicator of triangle one means refer to this for this type of room. And, um, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, electrical engineers starting to move toward that. And, and I like that a lot. It's a little bit of a learning curve for our inside team because they're looking for the spot and dot indications. But yeah. it's really helpful because going from manufacturer to manufacturer based upon what's listed or, or what we want to go after as like an approved equal or, or whatnot, we're, we're designing based upon what that manufacturer does well and how they need to do it as opposed to, oh, well, we could, you know, yeah, I guess we can, we can do that. We can try to make a, you know, Cooper look like a Leviton or this, that, or the other. And, and, um, that's just not ideal. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. So, so when you mm -hmm. had those sort of more generic drawings and stuff in the field and you had to make some mm -hmm. assumptions work it, in those instances where you had a third party commissioning agent coming out after the fact, if you had a disagreement about the interpretation of those drawings, right? How, how did you handle mm -hmm. that? And then, you know, it, like, cause if you had one interpretation and the third party commissioning agent has another, while the lighting designer had a completely different intent in the entire process, how did you sort of work through that on site so that it didn't cost everyone a whole bunch of money? Mm. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> I don't know. How, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, <laughs> the answer is the answer is nobody wins. Nobody wins in that scenario because the contractor gets frustrated. They often get spiteful, you know, and they're yep. going to be like, no, 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 the contract drawings, blah, 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 this, you know, and then the commissioning agent says, no, I went over there and I saw this and this other building. And then the designer is just way off in the back already working on 15 other projects. And, you know, they're going to find out about this later when the end user is like, hey, um, you know, what, what's going on there? So, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, in the end, it's it's either going to cost somebody a bunch of money um, or it's just going to be a lot of unnecessary conflict. You know, if it was just well defined um, in some sort of uh, some sort of format, it, it would have you know been avoided entirely. Um, yeah, so that's 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 good. So well, I did have a question for you guys. I know this is like please. off limits on a podcast. No, we love questions. I'm the guest. <laughs> but, uh, I, no, I we, see, we we've I had see, guests who just grill us the yeah. entire time, and it's great. We love it. Yeah. So as you know, I consider myself more of a rookie, and you guys more of of the veterans. Um, <laughs> so I want to hear from your perspective, architectural lighting controls, whether it's residential, commercial industrial, whatever. Um, what do you see as like the maybe one or two biggest sticking points or biggest issues in lighting controls that you either are seeing resolved or would like to see resolved? I have some in my head, but I'm interested to see what you guys uh, have to say to that. Ron, do you want to go first? No, go ahead. You go because okay. I have a funny right. feeling they're going to be exactly the same. <laughs> they probably are. <laughs> Um, I would say the biggest sticking point really is education. You know, mm -hmm. we are really, you know, we, we're really great at generating content, but we're not great at disseminating that content and sharing it with people who are not in this bubble, essentially. So we've mm -hmm. got the, you know, from your perspective, it, it, it's always, you know, I, I really appreciate that you think of me as an expert, but you know, I think there's this sort of like ivory tower experience with the experts of lighting controls where it's like, oh, they, they know way more than me. There's no re way I'm gonna reach their level of knowledge. And it's like, the only reason I'm where I'm at with knowledge is because I'm curious and I do dig really, really hard into like the, the really n nauseatingly boring stuff at times. And so, <laughs> right. um, there's some great resources out there if you know how to read them. There are some awful resources out there if you don't know how to read them. And yes. so we really need to do a better job educating and getting people elevated in their knowledge of lighting controls and not just, you know, the professionals, but the end users, everybody involved needs to be elevated mm. in their knowledge and, and capabilities. And so that's really the, the big sticking point for me. What about you, Ron? Yeah, so it's that, and then it's interoperability between mm -hmm. devices, mm -hmm. right? And, and yeah. I understand that systems are proprietary, and, and that's not likely going to change anytime soon. Software is going to be proprietary mm -hmm. to that specific system. What we need is interoperability between devices. You, you 
-hmm. as an owner should be able to, when a device fails, a motion sensor, a switch, they should be able to, should, I understand it doesn't happen right now, but they should be able to grab a switch from another system, put it in, and they should be able to program it. And, And that is part of what makes Dolly very attractive to people, right? Is the, the fact that you can grab manufacturer A switch, manufacturer B sensor and do what you need to do. Uh, and that needs to start making its way through some other systems um, and, and not just interoperability within the lighting systems, but we need to start thinking bigger picture. We need to mm. effectively work with building operating systems. We need to work with HVAC. We need to work with the, you know, the utility. Everything needs to come together because the rebates are no longer in the lighting. LEDs are, are king. Everyone already knows that. We're seeing that, right? That's what we heard from the DLC. Lighting rebates, psh, gone, see you bye. Uh, controls right. rebates are what we're going to start seeing moving forward. So if LEDs mm-hmm. have already hit that peak, well, now we need to start thinking bigger than that. And it really does come down to controls and being able to talk to more than just the lighting system. Right. Yeah, no, definitely agree. I um, going back on the educational point, you know, I think that, you know, you, you kind of hit it Webster of like, not just the professionals need to um, understand lighting controls. I think that a better job can be done as far as um, educating those installing uh, the control system and those programming the lighting control systems. And um, I think a really good opportunity for that, you know, I mentioned the IBEW earlier, you know, I'm somewhat still connected with with my local chapter and, um, you know, they're they're very open to having others like come in to educate. Um, Like right now, our our local 26 um, uh, classroom instruction, they do have a lighting controls class, but their lighting controls class is on one particular manufacturer. Got it. And so that's where I was like, you know, maybe we should look at some other folks coming in to, you know, provide a course that, you know, maybe hits it in a more generic sense or looks at six manufacturers and goes through and interprets, you know, how to read a submittal and how to install a system based off of that. Um, I could see that being a really good way to, um, educate the, the segment of installation. Um, I think the education resource through the, the LCA, um, and doing the CLCP and the classes associated with that. Um, I'm like, three quarters of the way through it. And it's already kind of blown my mind. I was like, what, what more can I learn about lighting controls? And I get one, one or two of those things in. And I'm like, I've already learned so much on lighting controls. I, I was a little, I was a little humbled by that, you know? Um, but yeah, that it, and the end users as well. I, I think that it's, it's very common for end users and engineers and, and everyone on like that part of the design team to say, just give us the minimum, give us what we need for lighting controls. Mm-hmm. We don't care. Yep. And so not seeing the value of, you know, I've looked at a few stadiums, programs some stadiums in the past and uh, just the concept of, I can go to an iPad and just use my little finger to touch a button. And then I just turned on like 800 amps worth of lighting. Right. <laughs> like, I think that that's insane. You know, the, the guy at, at his house, you know, if there's any sort of issues, can log into his iPad and control lights or, you know, that person in their office that has a headache that day can dim down lights by 10% and make it a more pleasant experience for him. So I think that, you know, there just needs to be more of like a value scene with lighting controls from the end user perspective. Um, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, and touching on the, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. You, you, yeah. you were Step down off the podium for three seconds. <laughs> I was going to um, kind of touch more on the interoperability side of things and um, I mean, how, how neat that would be. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the biggest issues I think with um, lighting controls is the main, like maintainability. And I think that's where yep. interoperability really comes into play of, you know, if I have this manufacturer's switch and say, for example, water damage because a pipe broke in my facility, you know, it can't be an insurance claim because it was kind of our building's fault and it's just a replacement of one device. And, you know, that, that switch may be 150, 200 bucks, whatever it is. And then you have, uh, six weeks later, a field service technician from whatever manufacturer coming in, charging 
you know, two thousand plus dollars to program that one switch, and all of a sudden, you know, you have one switch that once upon a time was a toggle switch that you could have picked up at Home Depot for two bucks. Now mm -hmm. it's a twenty five hundred dollar problem, and so that's where it kind of I think leaves a sour taste in the mouth of the end user uh, to consider a lighting control system that is, you know, advanced and provides all these additional features. Uh, because to them, it's like, it's a huge liability now uh, in comparison. So having a system that's maintainable um, and interoperable is, is kind of, that's, well, I, that is a key. I think that that's a really good point too, just to, to expand upon, um, you know, maintainability yeah. because one of the phrases that I like to say about lighting controls is it's a living, breathing entity and it needs mm -hmm. to be maintained. You can't just buy it and then leave it alone for 20 years and expect it to function just the same. Um, you know, I think the idea that was presented with LEDs is, well, it's forever, you know, you don't need to replace right. LEDs anymore. And so with that came this mentality of, well, lighting controls for LEDs are also forever. Um, but from mm -hmm. your perspective, you know, what's the best way to make sure that maintainability is on a project? <laughs> I mean, that, that can be, you know, from the specification side of like written in the specifications of, you know, the end user has the ability to, uh, you know, if a device goes bad to have that device installed and then program it to, to get it back into the system. It needs to be something that's as user friendly as that. And uh, for a lot of systems, that's a really, really high and lofty goal. For some systems, it's not. Um, right. So I think a lot of manufacturers need to uh, step it up as far as like, okay, the programming and the long term, five, 10, 15 years down the road view of this needs to be, hey, you know, facility manager X needs to go and be able to maintain their own systems programming. Uh, so I think a simplicity uh, side of it is, is incredibly important. Um, or, you know, a system where you can replace parts and components without reprogramming necessary. Um, so that could be a, another aspect there, but I think it has to come from the specification um, and manufacturers need to need to step up and, and get, get themselves up to par with that. Yeah. So I, I will. All right. So two things, one, yes. Mm -hmm. Systems where you can say this device is switch 32 and it just works is that's, that's the easiest way to handle it. Right. Because th mm -hmm. there's no reprogramming. It just, this device pulls its information from the network and it now knows what it is and it does what it needs to. That is the easiest way to handle this because to play devil's yeah. advocate, we can train whatever end user we want. We can train the maintenance guy. And in three years, when that maintenance guy leaves, the building almost never retrains somebody new. So now you had someone mm -hmm. who was trained on the software as part of the spec package, right? They got the software, they got a laptop or whatever. They were trained. That person leaves. Yeah. No one's now trained. Now here we are five, 10 years down the road and we've got the same problem all over again. So it's, right. I don't disagree that it needs to come from the spec side, but building owners also need to take some responsibility for the systems because unfortunately, right. We're just not there yet where we can truly make it as simple as replace a switch in a wall and it just works. And until we get there, mm. everyone kind of has to play a, a role in this. Yeah. So it sounds like we need to uh, invent a dolly system that has physical address dials on it. That's what it sounds like to me. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll, um, we'll work on that this afternoon. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I think it's also <laughs> just the serviceability of parts in general. Yes. Um, you know, sometimes you would void the warranty on a fixture by opening it up and taking the driver out. Uh, yeah. So that serviceability is, is a, a challenge. Um, additionally, there are parts and pieces of a control platform that might go poorly and need to be replaced. Who's doing the labor of that replacement work? So there, there's a lot of layers to this that, yeah, I can write a, a, a spec and I, a lot of the designers right now are screaming in my ears saying, you know, what the heck is this? Um, but, you know, yeah, you can write a line <laughs> that says, this is what I want. Yeah. But a lot of yeah. manufacturers would probably be like, they're never going to get that. 
Um, mm. And so, you know, personally, I think that's where integrators and, and uh, dealers get involved to support the project and say, we have a service plan, we will service your system yeah. for you. Um, and I know a lot of reps are also doing that too, offering integration services or maintenance services. Um, and even mm -hmm. contractors are starting to talk about creating service plans with the projects that they're doing so that should something yeah. go go bad, they're, they're there to support the project. Um, but I think, you know, to your point, you still need to specify it, but the infrastructure mm -hmm. also needs to be there to support that specification. And so, you know, the, the old adage of, if you don't specify it, it's wishful thinking, that's definitely one way to approach it. I think mm -hmm. if you don't have the infrastructure to support the specification, it's also wishful thinking. Um, so yeah. it is sort of this, this dual route this dual path uh, approach to it that we need to focus on. But uh, furthermore, I would say that that's an educational thing more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, but it is sort of education supporting maintenance and ongoing services. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so getting to your your new day job, um, being as as a mm -hmm. rep, so they they pulled you in because they needed a controls guy and you were the mm -hmm. controls guy they knew. Um, you know, what is you know, we've talked to several controls specialist reps out there, but it seems to vary by territory. And so I'm curious, you know, what is the, the landscape of the DC environment? Yeah, it's, um, it's a lot of government projects, which mm -hmm. means there's a lot of specifiers that hate the idea of wireless. Um, <laughs> so that's, that's one of my constant uh, daily battles is, okay, I mean, you don't want wireless, that's fine. We can go with a good wired system. But, um, you know, it's it's constantly something that I'm, I'm trying to break away at just for the sake of, um, you know, just opening up that field uh, to government related projects. Well, what are, so, what are the common issues or questions that you get when it comes to wireless? Um, the common issue question that I get uh, has to do with, well, somebody can just hack into that then, you know, mm -hmm. like somebody can, you know, security. pick up on that Bluetooth frequency and, and mm -hmm. get in and control the lights. And uh, even if you show them like, you know, this is not touching your network in any capacity, it's still a yep. concern to them that somebody can come in and alter their light levels. Um, so that's typically where it's, that's uh, a stopping point there because it's like, okay, that can happen. You know, I'm not going to lie to you and say that that cannot happen. You know, somebody much savvier than me can hack into any of these wireless systems and be able to control your lights. Um, and so that's, that's typically the, how the conversation goes. I also get weird conversations about like, you know, dual technology sensors, like they're listening to you, picking up on conversations. It's like, what, what it's actually like you know, measuring, you know, like if, if you were to make one of those dual tech sensors, a microphone, and that would be the microphone I use for this podcast, you would have no idea what I'm saying at all. It would be just like, yeah, nothing. It'd just be beeping. well. And, um, and that's if you're using an acoustic style dual tech, if you're using an ultrasonic right, sure. dual tech, you're, you're not picking up anything that's on the, the human level. <laughs> yeah. So even that is, uh, yeah, that's a funny conversation that's, that's typically had. Um, so yeah, with, with government clients, they want to hear that everything is by American compliant made in the United States. Um, and they want it wired and not touching their network in any capacity. Uh, that's, that's typically that. And, but that doesn't consume all of my work. You know, there's the typical commercial office spaces, education, um, we do a lot of data centers where we're at as well, because Northern, Northern Virginia, uh, which is within our territory, is like the data center capital of the world. So the most sure. boring concrete block buildings <laughs> for miles and miles and miles uh, with the most simple lighting and, you know, 70 CRI interior fixtures. And uh, <laughs> yeah, just the, nothing pretty, nothing exciting about them. They're just humongous. Um, and there's there's way too many of them. But yeah, primarily, um, you know, my goal is to call on electrical engineers and uh, lighting designers. And um, I, I'm very thankful for, um, you know, the team that I have around me because um, they've really just kind of introduced me to 
so many people in in the market that are just fantastic to work with that you know want to really pull us into the project so that we can provide you know an in-depth level of involvement and uh, i just find that portion of it so enjoyable where i can you know come up with ideas and present it to them and be like you know if receptacle load control is a is a huge um uh occupant discomfort thing you know and we're often seeing that you know in the dc metro area we have uh, um, like a green energy code that requires receptacle load control in offices classrooms conference rooms open offices that kind of stuff and uh, along with iecc 2021 starting to be more heavily adopted in, in maryland uh we're starting to see more and more of that and so trying to like pose some creative solutions to make it so it's not as much of a hindrance to the occupant. So, you know, utilizing time clock events to disable uh, the occupancy sensor controls for the plug loads during their regular business hours um, has been one um, that has, you know, we've gotten approved and whatnot, but that's just like a, a small example of like, okay, here's some input I have, you know, would you guys want to talk with DC about this to see if they would accept it. And then, you know, it's, it's just a fun process overall getting to kind of brainstorm a job and, and um, then see it come to fruition as well. And um, we have in-house technicians uh, that program our systems and service our systems. So it's really neat to be involved, like from the specification and our inside team is handling all of the, what I call the nasty side of dealing with distributors and then once it's actually out and being installed, our, our team uh, supporting it and, and uh, training the contractor and then programming it and then training the end user. So I get a, a unique glance of seeing the whole process of that, um, which, has been, which has been very enjoyable. So, so. was the issue with the, the plug loads, was that specifically that while the building was occupied, someone would get up, leave their office to go to the bathroom or do this. They'd come back and their computer was off or their devices were no longer charging because the plug loads had turned off on them. Yeah. So it was, it came from two directions. One, the end user. So the first thing is that, you know, when they notice that their plug is turning on and off on them, what has been happening since 2017, when this was implemented in DC is, you know, office workers picked up on this and they would plug, you know, extension cords or uh, power strips <laughs> into the switch that was not going to turn off on them. And then what yep. happened on the power distribution side is the panels are no longer balanced because all of the load is going to, you know, my odd circuits and my even circuits, which yep. were used for control are being unused. And so that that's affecting, you know, transformers on the power distribution side, causing harmonic dissonance, which, you know, is inducing heat on the neutral, neutral wires and everything. Yep. So, and then premature failed equipment on the power distribution side. So that was, um, a few studies have been conducted, um, in our territory. And I've spoken with a few of the engineers who were a part of that case study. And so, uh, one of my so projects I, was with one of those engineers. So it was, it was interesting. You, uh, you just threw it ton of big words at our listeners. I just oh, want to, I just want to like, uh, no, no, I, I love um, this kind of level of deep dive. I just want to make great. sure that our listeners are following along because, you know, harmonic right. dissonance is like, what the heck is that? Um, but basically you, what's nobody happening, knows that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but basically what's happening is because of the fact that energy code requires like 50% of receptacles to be switched by a mm -hmm. motion sensor or some other automatic feature. Uh, the, the office users have become savvy to this and started mm -hmm. bypassing that by just putting mm -hmm. an extension cord or, or another strip so that they could just plug into the always on plug. But because of the way that these, the, the power is often created to, for these spaces, you're often doing that switching um, based on the, the, the breakers, the legs of the breakers and the way that the, the power is distributed, it's, it can create an unevenness in how um, mm -hmm. the, there's basically three phases feeding into the, the building. And if those phases are not balanced, at least approximately the same, um, you can get really bad results and, and damage equipment and even yeah. cause like, you know, 
stuff to overheat, like you were saying. So as a mm. result, you know, this behavior that we've kind of engineered is a real problem because the goal was yeah. not to tell people use only the always on power. The goal was right, to right. basically say s only switch the non-important loads. Um, like if you have right. a laptop, it's fine if it switches off because you're going to leave it alone for a while. But, you know, even mm -hmm. there, it's just sort of like, what is the goal here? We're trying to save energy and people are finding ways to bypass that. Yeah. And our, our, um, mission was to make receptacle load control in this particular building unnoticed. And so that's where, okay, now, instead of typically having all of our private offices as standalone, now we're actually having our private offices and every area across the project being on the lighting control network so that we can program time clocks and all of that stuff so that, you know, and this is a, a big thing where, um, you know, typically you're not allowed to bring space heaters in and stuff like that. But what happens in every single building I've ever been to that I've, right. you know, <laughs> been alongside for an energy audit is you walk into an office, it's blazing hot. There's nobody in there no lights are on, nobody's been in there all week, and there's a space heater running. So that's where it's like, okay, well, if we disable this uh, during the daytime and it only turns on, you know, like if there is occupancy picked up, like at the beginning of the day, um, then we can cause a scenario where, okay, they may plug their uh, unauthorized space heater into their <laughs> controlled receptacle, and when they're not there uh, after they leave home for the day, it will turn off and it's not going to come back on until they come into the office on Monday or Tuesday the following week. So that was like, OK, let's let's think about this in light of what we've seen and propose a solution that, you know, may not be perfect, but be a bit better. <laughs> so, yeah, well, and, and I think, you know, one. that's really interesting, um, you know, to think about using conditional logic in that way, because yeah. um, not all manufacturers have the ability to do conditional logic like that. But mm -hmm. the ones that can do that, I think, you know, those sorts of applications are fantastic. I love those sorts of things, because it's like you're yeah. actually thinking through and providing a custom programming solution for the need of the project. And so mm -hmm. that that's really awesome to, to hear about. And I think, you know, this is going on, on to the territory of one of the questions Ron and I always ask, which is, um, you know, who should be in charge of the lighting controls design? And I would say that this is an mm -hmm. argument for the reps to do that because, you know, I've, this is, this is a phrase that a friend, a colleague of mine gave me a long time ago, but the rep is the glue that holds the project together and who better mm -hmm. to provide that solution than the glue. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, you know, as a rep, very biased, I'm going to agree. Um, <laughs> but I would still say that, you know, the design, uh, you know, if there's a lighting designer involved, we're seeing a lot more lighting designers in, in our territory being very heavily involved with the lighting controls in a very thoughtful mm -hmm. manner. Um, and that's been really exciting to see. Um, it's a, it's a bit of a learning curve for some, as we've noticed, um, because, you know, it's, it's a new thing to them. Um, not, not all of them though. Some of them, you know, I know of, uh, a good, you know, mutual friend of ours, Webster, uh, Ben Sullivan at CM clean, he is their lighting control designer. Right. Um, and so it's, it's really neat to see the, the, uh, design firms that are taking lighting control seriously to that level of like, nah, you know, just give us the minimum. We don't care about lighting control. So like, Oh no, we care about light controls. Let's actually, <laughs> uh, maximize right. the value and, and not, not hurt ourselves here. Um, but yeah, I think the design team still needs to to take the charge in that and then depend upon the reps as well. Um, you know, if they if they can kind of pass off some of the the duty to us and then just interact with us, make sure that we've dotted all our I's, crossed all our T's. Um, those have been the, the best uh, scenarios. Um, you know, that's that's how you get to doing things like lumen maintenance dimming with a service plan. Um, right. You know, that's not typically thought of, you know, from the start of a project when you're in concept pictures and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. But think about just the level of value that's delivered by saying, OK, no, we're going to, you know, have the lighting uh, well coordinated with the controls. We're going to have it go to no more than 80 percent output. We're going to run all our calcs at 80 percent output. And then over the course of five years, we're going to take 
light level readings and then we're going to actually increase the output based upon what you need and it's going to you know increase the life of your luminaires you know and really take advantage of the control system that you have so um that's where it's that's another one of those educate the end users here's something that's mm -hmm, this right. is something we couldn't do before you know there's no way to do that before but now we have a way to do that which is really unique and additionally it goes along the lines of um make making sure that you have that clarified early on so that yeah. you know it, it's expected and understood that that's going to need to happen right yeah no, absolutely but, if, if that can be thought of and started to implement during the actual design process that's you know then it's locked in and we're of the perspective that oh we can do that think about the the value that's being delivered there Nice. I, so I am curious. I do want to circle back to one thing. I'm, I'm very curious, having the field experience that you have, how has that helped your relationship with designers and stuff being from the rep agency where you go to a designer or to an engineer and they start talking about the system and you can talk about the practical side and tell them that, you know, that's a great in theory, but in practice, this isn't going to work quite the way mm -hmm. you think it is. And how has that helped um, that relationship and, and trust between you as the, you know, the rep with those other entities. Yeah, it's definitely helped them, uh, to depend on me for, uh, reliable, like schematic understanding of things. Like here's how everything is piecing together. Um, but you know, those, those high and lofty, uh, goals and design, you know, they all have implications. I mentioned the project where every single private office is on the network. Every single private office has conditional logic. You know, I was consulting with our, you know, the factory and our field team who programs these systems and just getting their input because I knew that there would be, you know, an increased level of programming. It's probably going to take three times as long and take, you know, two technicians to be on site or three technicians at sometimes just to make sure that the project is being delivered on time. And so with that, you know, being very clear of like, there is going to be an added cost for doing this. Um, but we may see a, a huge benefit if you think that, you know, cost comparison here, that, that, that this is going to be worth it. Um, so I think helping them manage expectations on, um, a more like programming and installation side, uh, has been pretty helpful. I've also had a number of instances where, uh, there's something talked about in design development and then, you know, it kind of hits my ears a little bug and I'm like, mm, I don't, let me, let me, <laughs> let me push back on this just a little bit here. Um, <laughs> so, you know, cause I've, well, you know, I've installed, you know, some pretty crazy fixtures before and, <laughs> you know, I, I can just see like issues with, okay, how are we going to mount this? Are you going to find the cord drop and an aircraft cable that can span 30 feet here and then surface mount over here and all, all this stuff uh, when it comes to that? And then, um, yeah, on the control side of things, uh, just in, in the review, I, I often come across a few things where I can kind of cue in the electrical engineer and provide some additional uh, input where where respectful and where necessary of course so mm -hmm. yeah well of course and but but uh, again you know it goes uh, along the same lines of where the majority of people we interview say like you know get me involved early i don't care if it's a right. five minute meeting mm -hmm. it's just like get me to, to to speak on this but we're almost out of time here so i i want to i want to encapsulate what we've discussed here uh it's really mm -hmm. cool stuff really appreciate you coming on and and sharing your story because um and it would love to have more contractors come on. So, mm. you know, if any of our listeners know yeah. of anybody who wants to be on the show, if you know of anybody who wants to be on our show, please, you know, let us know, send them our way. Um, but I mean, basically, you know, you, you come from this, this installation background with the I, IBEW mm -hmm. and, um, from that perspective, you know, there is a lot of challenges to the installation process of lighting controls. And we are getting better on the design side of providing thorough documentation that's clear enough for installers to follow. Mm -hmm. But there still is that 
disconnect that that's happening. And in a lot of cases, there's still vague RCPs that just kind of allude to what is expected, but not actually giving strict guidance or, or um, mm -hmm. performance expectations for the project. And so you, as a as an installer, had to guess what was being implemented. Whereas as a rep, you know, in your current job, you really have a better opportunity to step in and at earlier on in the project and say, okay, you know, here's what I'm hearing. Um, this is what we can offer to provide the solution for you regarding that. Mm -hmm. um, there's still a lot of hesitation with certain technologies such as wireless, especially mm -hmm. in government buildings and as it pertains to cybersecurity. Uh, but, you know, that's, that seems to be an ongoing discussion as it is. And I don't know if mm -hmm. we'll ever get to a point where we can, you know, definitively say we're done talking about this. I think it's always going to be hmm. a topic of discussion, but I think, you know, yeah. you bring up really good points about air gapping your system so that it's not touching yep. another system. Um, not all wireless systems mm -hmm. are Bluetooth. So if Bluetooth is a, is a debate topic, it might be a different protocol that you want to use, but regardless, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's still a lot of hesitancy for that adoption. And so wired, um, when it comes to government buildings, especially, you know, is, is the standard for lighting control solutions. And so I think anybody who, who any brands out there that are all wireless are unfortunately getting eliminated from that solution mm. in a lot of cases, right. which is sad because I think the technologies that are out there, there's always great resources from all of the brands that are out there um, and are definitely worth considering. But, you know, from mm. your perspective, having that, seat at the table early on at least helps you be a part of that conversation and help facilitate you know this sort of approach to conditional logic which is a, a programming style that is useful um to making sure that you know if then criteria is met you know mm -hmm. if somebody walks into the room and it's during business hours then this will happen um and yeah. so that's really powerful programming capabilities that a lot of brands do offer in our industry. Mm -hmm. um, and it's worth thinking through and, and coming up with those custom solutions for projects. Uh, and then tying back to the questions that you asked us, I, I think, you know, part of it is that we really need to do a much better job of educating. And I think, you know, if any educators listening to this are interested in getting involved with IBEW or any other groups that are out there that are reaching out to the builder groups or end user groups, you know, I think this should be your charge to, to try to take action and get involved. Um, but then also interoperability is a big deal and maintenance is a big deal. And, um, you know, all of this is, is just really important stuff for, for us to be focusing on as an industry. But did I did I miss anything in in my recap? I don't think you did. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was a awesome. nice dense recap there. Good job. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> but awesome. but yeah, I mean, you know, I think this whole this whole perspective here that we have, um, you know, it, it really is a team effort. And so having mm -hmm. people from different perspectives in new roles yes. or, or just continuing to do their same role, but thinking outside of their role to the other groups is really where we're going to, how we're going to succeed here. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, one last thing, just as like an advisement for, for reps and what we've seen even recently is, um, uh, I think in our, our history, you know, at like, as my rep agency in particular, um, there was a time where we were just focused on winning jobs, you know, and mm -hmm. it wasn't a matter of like, were we a good fit for the job? Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, for controls, it was a, a long-term sticking point for us where, um, you know, maybe we didn't make the best reputation for ourselves because we were going after every project just to, mm -hmm. you know, just to get on it. Um, and so, making sure that whatever you put out is going to be something that should be there, you know, is, is key. And, um, being very involved with, uh, the specifiers, like the inside team, you know, as, as a practice is constantly reaching out to me that say like, Hey, should we, should we quote this? We're not listed. It's like, maybe we shouldn't on this one. I can go out yep. to speak with that specifier, but unless yeah. they're 
saying, okay, we'll accept equals. If you come, you know, discuss with us, let's not touch it. You know, let's yeah. not harm our relationships and let's not put out, put us out there as doing something that we should not be doing. It's going to bite us in the end. So we've definitely seen, um, doing right by our specifiers and making sure that whatever we're putting together for a project is, you know, a good solution that meets the design intent that that serves us in the end. And, uh, it helps our specifiers, our contractors, distributors to know, like, no, we, we do right. We, we do the right thing by our clients and, you know, we're not just a, a, a hungry agency trying to get after every single project that we have no business right. getting after. Um, let's just do right by our clients and, and it'll come back to us. So, yeah, no, that's, that's great to hear. And it, it goes a long way too, with the, having a, a, a clear scope and a design intent mm -hmm. and having that narrative and having those drawings, because it's a lot easier if you have proper documentation to figure out if it's if you are the right fit or not right which will alleviate mm -hmm. some of the issues we've seen in the past because you know people will know you know what no our solution's not the best fit for this given this intent narrative so it is good right. to hear and, and you know you hammered home the same thing that we say all the time with education but you kind of took it a step further in that it, it really does take a village on these projects no one person mm -hmm. has all the answers, right? And we all look at it from different angles. So getting an entire team of people involved sooner is, is really going to be only a benefit to the project. Because if you have all the interested parties, all the stakeholders together, you know, if the mm -hmm. contractor's on board, the rep is on board, the design team's on board, the engineer, if everyone is working together that's on the project, you'll make sure that you eliminate any potential holes and gaps within the control system and really deal with things early on. So it, it really does take a team to put together a cohesive project and make sure that things go smoothly. And then, uh, like you mentioned, and Webster mentioned, if people are, you know, it's, it's great to hear that, you know, the, the local IBW is looking for those resources and looking to get more education for their for people. If anyone from the 103 is listening, Webster and I are both in Boston, and I know a lot of the 103 guys know both of us. So, if anyone from 103 is listening, reach out. We'd be we'd yeah. love to have that conversation. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, we'd love to have you on the show too. But we'd love to have that conversation if we can assist in providing you some of those resources. Even if it's not us, we have connections to yeah. the right people. We Absolutely. can certainly help put you in touch. So, Kelly absolutely fantastic conversation like really appreciate your time your perspective on everything you know having sort of seen both sides as a contractor and as the rep it's 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 great to sort of get that perspective and get that understanding from you and see how things are slightly different in the dc metro area mm -hmm. than they are here in the boston area so really thank you right. so much for your time we really appreciate it yeah thank you both this has been this has been great Awesome. Well, thank you again. I just want to take a minute to remind everyone today's episode was presented by the LCA, the Lighting Controls Association. And it's financially supported by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, or NAILED. Check out our website, lightingcontrolspodcast.com. We've got all of our episodes, a news feed, a merch store, uh, trainings that Ron and I might be doing, maybe for IBEW or not. Um, <laughs> but, you know, additionally, we've got uh, our council that we're starting up on startup and integration services. And finally, if you want to support the podcast in a real way, we would really appreciate sponsors who want to be a part of this dialogue and, and get involved. So please reach out to us if you want to be part of this. But until then, thank you so much for joining us. And Kelly, thank you as well. Really awesome conversation.